Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome uh, uh, to, to uh, tonight's webinar on getting set for 2024. Uh, my name is Kevin Brennan. I'm the local dairy advisor here in uh, Oak Park and Carlow. And I suppose the purpose of tonight's webinar um, is to make you aware, I suppose, of the different changes and regulation which is happening on your dairy and tillage enterprise for 2024. We're lucky enough to be joined by by uh, Katie Dial, um, and she's going to be the uh, first person presenting tonight. Katie's going to be looking at the fertilizer uh, database, uh, soil sampling, and uh, nutrient management planning. Uh, Katie is based in uh, Tina Healy as a dairy advisor. We're also joined uh, on the call by Pamela McCormack, uh, again, uh, local dairy advisor in Johnstown Castle. Um, Pamela's going We'll be looking at nitrate zoning, banding, soil water, uh, and and slurry movements. Um, and finally, uh, we're going to move on to Pat Power, uh, a tillage advisor based in Johnstown Castle. Pat is going to be looking at uh, crop rotation, diversification, buffer zones, and green cover. We're also joined on the call by uh, Kay O'Connell, um, who is um, uh, another dairy advisor based in Johnstown Castle, and she's going to be helping me, I suppose, run, run the event tonight and, and be dealing with the questions as, as they're coming through. I suppose the plan, uh, if you have, in order to keep it as engaging as possible, any questions that you do have, you can put it into the Q&A uh, function uh, on your screen. Um, look, keep the questions coming, and after each presentation, uh, we'll, we'll ask one or two questions. The presentations will be between about 10 and 15 minutes long, um, and uh, I suppose with that, I suppose we'll start off, um, uh, Katie. So I'll stop sharing there now. Thanks, Kevin. So, um, like Kevin said, my name is Katie Doyle and I'm the Dairy Advisor in the Tinnahealy office. So, I'm going to be running through the fertilizer database, soil sampling requirements and your nutrient management plan requirements going forward. So, the fertilizer database was set up in 2023. From the 1st of September 23, all farmers need to be registered as end users before they can buy any fertilizer or lime. So if you haven't registered, you're putting yourself into the position that where merchants and co-ops won't be able to sell you any form of fertilizer or lime. Registration takes place on your ag food account under the National Fertilizer Database portal. And it's a simple tick, tick the box exercise. And once you've done so, then you're classified as a registered end user. Once registered, then you're required to declare your closing stock yearly. So by the 15th of October of each year, you have to declare whether you have or have not any stock on your farm on the system. So it's important that if you haven't already done so to get registered on the system, if you are registered to declare your closing stock for 23, this system is still open. And if you, if you haven't got any uh, fertilizer allowances, this is important to know your fertilizer allowances going forward. So there's a key term, called the organic nitrogen figure. And this figure is becoming an important thing in farming uh, going forward. So what we mean by your organic nitrogen figure is the total amount of organic nitrogen excreted by your animals on the farm for the year divided by all the hectares of land declared on your base application for that year. So your whole farm stock and rate then is all the organic nitrogen across all the land, including your tillage ground. Your grassland stocking rate then is all the organic nitrogen divided across your grassland area only. And why these are becoming important things in farming is under the nitrates rules and regulations, there's certain criteria if you fall under certain grassland stocking rates that you have to abide by, one of these being your soil sample. So if you fall under certain criteria going forward, you are required to have soil samples. So for 2024, if you fall under these brackets, you require soil samples. So if your holding is above 130 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare for the year, you are required to have soil samples taken. If you have any arable land in under your base application for the year, you are also required to have soil samples. And if you are approved acres participant, you are also required to have soil samples. Valid soil samples then depending on what criteria you fall under. So if you are a farm, a farm 
falling under the grassland stocking rate above 130 kilograms per hectare. And if you have any arable land, you must have valid soil samples taken since the 15th of September 2020. If you are an approved acres participant, then all soil samples must be taken after the 1st of January 2022. A soil sample then uh, must be up to a maximum of five hectares, which is equivalent to 12 acres, and they must be taken every four years. If you don't have soil samples then taken, or if you're waiting on soil sample results, you technically have no chemical phosphorus allowance. So the only thing that you can buy then fertilizer wise is nitrogen until you get your results back. If you fall under the grassland stocking rate of 130 kilograms per hectare, you have a small allowance for phosphorus. This equates to seven kilograms per hectare, which is the equivalent of one or less than one bag of 18612 per acre per year. If you haven't taken soil samples, it's recommended that you take them as soon as possible and to allow a minimum of three months since the last time you spread fertilizer, slurry, dung or dairy washing. This is a narrow window, but to get the most out of your soil samples, it's recommended that you allow this three month period between taking your soil samples and the last time any of this was spread. From the soil samples, then we can use the results in a nutrient management plan. A nutrient management plan provides you with information on how to grow your crop, be it just grass or tillage crop, to their maximum potential. So there's many factors that we take into account when we're doing up these nutrient management plans. Some of them being your land details, crop and plan, stock numbers, your soil test being the most important one, total tons of concentrates fed on the farm for the previous year, proof of additional yield for arable crops and details of any fertilizer in stock. Once we have all this information, it's all put into a nutrient management plan system. And from all that information, we can determine how much lime you require to be spread on your land and also your maximum chemical allowance. So as you can see on this, this is a little snippet from an NMP plan where it, it outlines your lime required for the, four year, the next four years. And it will also allow you to see how much fertilizer in the form of nitrogen and phosphorus you're allowed on your land. So taking this farmer as an example, you can see that he has an allowance of 20,993 kilograms of nitrogen and 3,621 kilograms of phosphorus. So from this allowance, then we can put this allowance into a plan and outline how much fertilizer, be it protected urea, 10, 10, 20, 18, 6, 12, that farmer is allowed to spread for that year. These fertilizer allowances can be changed to the fertilizer that you want spread for your yourselves or what's available on the market. Uh, it's important to contact your advisor to get these NMP plans completed before you start buying or before you actually go out to spread fertilizer so that you don't go over your allowances for the year. The fertilizer database is going to be on on record monthly, so realistically you should be able to buy within your limits if you know your your allowances for the year if an important take-home message is that if you haven't registered yourself for the fertilizer database to do so um, and if you are already are registered on the system to declare your closing stock for 23 it is important to know your grass and stock and rate figure if you haven't already calculated this it's important to contact your advisor to do so um, if you haven't taken soil samples or if you are falling under these categories to have soil samples taken, it is important to contact your local soil sampler or your advisor to organise to get these taken. And it, then from these, you'll be able to use your NMP plan to work out your allowances and optimise soil fertility and nutrient usage on your farm. So that's me. So if there's any questions, I'll take them then. Thanks very much for that, Kay. It was very informative. Um, just one thing there before Kay comes in with questions. Um, at the end, uh, just for a bit of information for ourselves, um, I'll put up a QR code and you might just give a bit of feedback. It'll only take, uh, you know, one or two minutes, but but it's important just for having these events in the future. So, um, if you wouldn't mind doing that. So, as Kay, there's a good few questions coming in there, uh, as I can see there. Um, have you just a few questions there for for Katie? So. Thanks, Kevin. Um, yeah, Katie, just one question there on the fertilizer register. Where do people go to register or to check if they have, if they haven't been got their information on the fertilizer database? 
So if they have an Ag Food account, you can log on in under your name under the Ag Food account, and there's a national fertilizer database tab on the Ag Food system. In that, then, if you have registered, you'll appear with three dots, and that's showing that you are a registered applicant on the Ag Food system. If not, there will be a plus sign there. Simply just tick the plus. Uh, the terms and conditions will come up. You tick the box that you've read them and accepted them, and then once you've done that, then you're a registered end user. And then for your uh, clothes and socks, then once you are registered, the three dots will appear on that, then it will have a drop down kind of list of, of things associated with being an end user and you'll see clothing socks coming up. And then it's just simply list your your closing socks or if you have none, there's a nail box just to tick. Okay, so it's very, so it, it is user friendly. And you are required to declare even if you had no closing stocks. Correct, yeah. Okay. And your advisor can also help out if this is totally oh, yeah. alien to, to Yeah, 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 yeah. No, your your advisor will have um access to the National Fertilizer Database as well. Okay. Um Katie, there's another one there then somebody was wondering if there are charge for the nutrient management plants. Uh yes, there is a charge unfortunately, but it's because it's a very complex system and it does take time to calculate your allowances so unfortunately there is a, a charge but it's well worth it when you're being compliant at the end of the day yeah okay um so it'll depend on the the scale or the amount of work is it yeah exactly so if you've okay. an existing nmp plan it'll, it'll depend on the amount of workload uh, associated with your plan if you're a new plan or if there's a new plan needs to be set up of course there's going to be additional charges for that Okay, and then there's one last one there for you, Katie. Um, just somebody was wondering they they have soil samples, but they don't have enough. You said you needed one for every five hectares, so they only have part of the farm. What is the implications, or what did they need to do? So for any land not soil samples, they're assumed index four, which means that you've no fertilizer, or fertilizer, phosphorus allowance. So until you have a soil sample for them, technically there's no fertilizer phosphorus allowed on that plot. So once okay. once the soil sample is taken, it will be used the soil sample results will be used for the allowances, but until that is taken, they're assumed in next four. So no no fertilizer phosphorus allowance. Um there is a question there. Um I guess somebody was looking for the ID code. So I'll put that into the chat just um for the link to the to the, the call or to the webinar. Okay, thanks Katie. Just to remind everybody you can put in questions along the way um on, on the QA function down at the bottom of your screen. All right. Yeah, thanks for that, Kate. Um yeah look at it just says uh Pamela Pamela McCormick's getting her slides up there. Um as Kay has said, you know, if you have any, uh, just there's plenty of questions coming in, but keep the questions coming and, and we'll answer them in, in due course. So um, we'll just pass over to yourself now, Pamela. Thanks, Kevin. So um, my name is Pamela McCormick, as Kevin has said. Um, I'm a dairy advisor based down in Johnstown Castle. Um, and I'm going to talk to you tonight about certain things. Um, maybe some of them are new and some of them are in a year or two. Uh, relevant to the dairy side of things and um, just some new rules that people should be aware of. So uh, the different areas I'm going to cover tonight then is the nitrate zones. So the map that came out that uh, is limited in some farmers stocking rates to 220 and then some farmers are still in 250. So we'll take a look at that map and see what areas that's covering and the implications that is there because of that. We're going to look at banding and look at the three different bands and the implications of those bands on some people's stocking rates. Um, soil and water, uh, the rules around storing soil water and the different ways that this can be stored. And then just in general, a quick look at some slurry movements and the implications for both the importer and the exporter. So if you look here at the um, a blue map on the right hand side, you can see the area that is um the blue area here then is covered 
Um, that is now covered as an, a 220 area and that is the stock rate if your land is within the blue area. If your land is not within the blue area on that map, your stock rate is then at 250 and it remains the same for 2024. However, there is some land, obviously, it's done on a very localised basis and there is some land that some farms might have some area in 220 and some area in 250. So as you can see here, then you'll be in a hybrid limit, which means if half your land is in 250 and half your land is in 220, your new stocking rate could be 235, for example. This is done on a lipis parcel basis. And if any area of that lipis parcel is in 250, the parcel then stays as 250, the whole parcel counts. So this means that each farm needs to be looked at individually. You can't just look at it in general. Um, and I suppose it means it's very important for you to look at now that if you have half your land or three quarters of your land in that blue area, it has um big implications for you down the line. So I suppose the question is, what are your options if your area has been reduced within the 220 zone? So if you look at this, what are the implications of my new stocking rate? The new stocking rates I suppose to look at now is 170, 220, 250, or if you're in this hybrid area that some of your farm is in 220 and some of your farm is 250. So what it does it happens if you ex exceed any of those above target limits? You, if you exceed obviously the 170, you're looking at needing to go into derogation or something. But down the line, it does mean if you end 2024 above any of the above limits, whichever one is relevant to you, it means you're facing a penalty. So you have a reduction in your base payment. And you're also, if you're in derogation and you finish over the 220 or 250, you're kicked out of derogation for this year and you're also cannot apply for next year either which means your stock rate will then be 170, which causes a lot of implications. And I suppose what also the people who are looking at the map and think maybe oh, I got away with it this year, I'm not in the blue area. There is complications down the line. It's not it's subject to legislation, but it is potentially in 2025, 2026, possibly the whole country could be in a 220 area, which means every farmer could be at risk of being reduced to 220. And I suppose it is something people need to be aware of down the line. So what are my options? Um, if you're going back to your new stock rate is 220 and you've always been stocked right up at that 250, you have to look at what options you have for you. Um, possibly reducing stock numbers could be an option. Looking at rent and land. With the price of land, you have to look at whether that's, does that suit you financially? Contract rearing is also an option. Removing those young stock off the land and into a with a contract rear would reduce your stocking rate and could be an option. It is an awful lot of an option for an awful lot of farmers. And then also you have to look at the ex export and slurry as an option. Um, I export it maybe to lowly stocked dry stock farmers, tillage farmers, or there is plenty of organic farmers there as well willing to take your slurry. Uh, so the next area I'm going to look at is banding. So banding was introduced in 2023. Um, there's three bands. So in terms of kilos of milk, if you have less than four and a half thousand kilos of milk, you're in band one. Between four and a half and six and a half thousand kilos of milk, you're in band two. And if you've over six and a half thousand kilos of milk, uh, you're in band three. So where that figure comes from is it's the average number of cows. So it's the, it's the total milk supplied to the factory divided by the average number of cows in your herd for the whole year. And you can look at it then. So you have to select that band on ICBF and there's two options. So you can use last year's milk supply or you can look at the average of the previous three years milk supplies. Um, and this must be selected on ICBF each year and it has to be done every year. So there are some options then to look at if people, it doesn't affect a massive amount of people. There's 16 or 17% of farmers in Ireland in band three. But I suppose there's a lot of farmers there very nearly hitting into band three. And that's what people need to be aware of, of where they sit within the band they're in and possibly some options of avoiding going into band three or if you're barely into band three, how you got, could get yourself back to band two. So one option obviously would be to feed milk to calves because the figure that's being used is the milk that's going to the creamery. So at the minute, if you were feeding milk powder and you started feeding your whole milk to calves, this would make a difference in the amount of milk actually delivered to your creamery. Um, you could reduce meal feeding in the summertime where 
you've plenty of grass, but obviously this would require good grassland management and you'd still need to feed your cows good quality grass. Um, you could dry off that bit earlier um, or some herds maybe kind of milking once a day early in the season or late in the season. Um, and then, so if you keep your dry cows for that bit longer, um, because it's calculated on an average cows in your herd for a year basis, this could reduce your overall of what band you're in. But then I suppose this will also increase your whole farm stock rate on the other side. So that has to be looked at very carefully to see, can it be justified and does it make sense for your farm? So then we're going to look at some new rules or regulations that have came in in the last couple of years for different farms. So all farms in general, first, if we look at, this came in in 2021, I think. Uh, so runoff from roadways has to be diverted away from the water body. So this means your roadway has to be sloped that the water is running into the field before it meets the waterway. It can't be just directed directly into the gripe. This There is a lot of roadways on farms that need to be corrected or adjusted um, as this, this is a problem and it needs to be corrected. This rule is in and it's it's a very important rule and it's relevant for all farmers. So if you look at then a new rule last year, you're looking at silage bales can only be two bales high without an effluent in storage. So unless your bales are stored on a concrete that the effluent is controlled and it has channels around, you can't put your bales any higher than two bales high. Then if you look at farms that are in derogation or have applied for derogation, plowing of land um, is only allowed between the 1st of March and the 31st of May. This is for grassland only, but it, it is important if people are reseeding and stuff, it's very important to be aware of this rule as it is relegate. Um, if you break a rule of derogation, you will be removed from derogation. So it's very important to know these new rules that are coming into play. And then if you look at some of the requirements for the lower stocked farms, not necessarily just derogation farms, have some of these rules. So if your whole whole farm stocking rate is less is greater than 130 it's your grassland stock rate is greater than 130 you have to spread your slurry using less which is a dribble bar a trail and shoe or an injection system and also you're not supposed to feed animals over two years of age crude protein of more than 15 percent crude protein between april and september this is an important rule that i suppose many people are not aware of but it is there under the nitrates action plan and then if your grassland stocking rate is over 170, you're also, um, these rules came in in 2021 and your livestock are to be prevented from accessing water courses. So you have to fence the water course 1.5 meters back. And also the location of trucks from where the water course is has to be 20 meters away from the water course. So I suppose the picture on the right of your animal down in the river has to be, is becoming a thing of the past. And it shouldn't be seen on any farm that's stocked over 170 in a grassland stocking rate. So now we're looking at soil water storage and your requirements for 2024. So there's a closed period from the 1st to the 31st of December. Um, and there's no spreading of soil water and every farm must have 31 days storage for soil water. So for winter milk suppliers, the closed period is between the 10th and the 31st of December this year and then for 2025 you have to have 31 days storage so this is allowing the person with a winter milk contract to an extra year's grace to get um, the storage there so i suppose the question is what is soil water and what is not classified as soil water so if we look here at some things so soil water then is your parlor washings your bull tank washings your rainwater on the collecting yard that is all counted as soil water. So the calculations for these then we'll look at in a minute. But I suppose what's very important to note is like the picture here on the right, if you're feeding on a collecting yard, this is now classified as slurry. It is no longer called soil water because the cows are standing on it for that time period that they're eating. And it's now counted as slurry and can no longer be classified as soil water. This means that the you need to do a calculation and see what storage you have there. A lot of farmers struggled to get 21 days storage last year. 
And I suppose it's very important to have 31 day storage for this year. So it, it, I think it means that a lot of farmers have to sit down and look at their figures and see what storage they have available to them. So if you look at the options here um, of soil water tank, if you're storing all your soil water separately away from your slurridge, slurry, you need 31 days storage. So the way that figure is calculated is it's the maximum number of cows in your herd, which people need to be aware of. It might It's not necessarily the cows you're milking in December. It's the maximum number of cows in your herd at any stage during the year. Often for farmers, this is the number of cows you might have in your herd in April. So then there's no store soil water calculations are you've 30 litres of soil water produced per cow per day. And then you're storing this for 31 days for the month of December. And then you have to add on any rainfall on your collecting yard. So as you can see in the photo on the left here, the rainwater is landing on that yard and then that's been cleaned and into a soil water tank. So you have to allow for that. On average in the region, you're looking at probably 25 mil of rainwater a week to be allowed for, for that 31 days. And yet it's important to include that water. The other option would be to store your soil water with slurry, which means your soil water is now beco becoming slurry itself and can't be spread for the 16 week period or 112 days. So the average number of cows milk during the closed period is counted for this. Multiply that by 30 litres per cow and then you multiply by up to 112 days of a close period and then you have to add on the rainwater. So this is an awful lot of a higher figure over 112 days because it's obviously considerably higher than 31 days. So if I look at this on an average farm, look, call it 100 cows. You've 30 litres for 31 days is just over 90,000 litres of water, of soil water. However, if you store that with slurry you're allowing for eight weeks of your cows are all your cows all 100 cows are milking for four weeks half your cows are milking and for four weeks your parlor door is closed and no cows are milking this is now 210,000 liters of water to be stored because it's been stored as slurry so there's an awful lot of difference in the storage you require and it makes a big difference in the infrastructure you require on your farm so it is definitely something you need to consider and probably worth measuring your sheds for and your tanks. Now, so the last thing we're looking at here then is slurry movements. Um, so I think it's very important that slurry movements are looked at early in the year. And if you need to export or you're importing slurry, that you make an agreement with the farmer you're exporting it to and it's well done in advance and early in the year. So both parties understand the requirements of what's needed for taking this slurry online. So in terms of the importer and what they need to think about, they must have an allowance to take the slurry or manure and they must understand that imported slurry is to replace the chemical fertilizer purchases. So as Katie explained earlier on, when the farmer will do an NMP, they will know how much P that they're allowed to buy. If they buy this from the co-op in the bag or they get it through your slurry, they're still only allowed the same amount of P that their NMP told them at the start of the year. So then it comes into here, the exporter, plan ahead, contact the importer now. It's very important to look at that. For example, if you're exporting to a tillage farmer and they have a, an allowance for phosphorus of 2000 kilograms, this means that they can either, if they're going to sow their crops in a month's time, they're going to be buying any P that they're buying for the year. They'll have bought it within the next three weeks. This means if they have 2,000 kilos of P of an allowance, they can buy 20 tonne of 10, 10, 20 or 33 tonne of 18, 6, 12. But this means that their slurry is now or all their P allowance is now used up. So they have no room for your slurry on their land anymore because they have used all of their P allowance. So this means if you ring them in September that you actually kept more stock than you thought you were going to keep. This tillage farmer has no land to put it on at this stage because their crops are cut, but they also have used up their pea allowance for the year. And I suppose that's very important. It's also important to look at, is there enough slurry to export when did the importer actually wants it? So can you export to them early in the year and can you export it to them when they want it before they sow those crops? And I suppose you also need to consider that 
because you've now moved this P and K off your farm that you might need to purchase extra fertilizer that you have now sent out the gate to replace the P and the K that you produced on your farm. So I suppose the take home messages for tonight then, we need to make a plan for your farm. Um, if you're affected by the 220, you need to select your nitrates band for 2024 and you need to calculate your soil water production and storage. And I suppose if part of your plan is needing to uh, create an export, you need to think about that and you need to see who's who can take it and when they can take it. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for that, uh, Pamela. A very interesting presentation. Um, there's a good few questions coming in there, Kay. Uh, we might, I suppose, drive straight on to that. Again, uh, just at the end, just remind you to stay on. The, 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 we just want to get a bit of feedback and uh, we'll, I'll put it up at the end just a QR code. So, uh, Kay, yeah, um, there's a good few questions coming in there. Thanks, Kevin. Um, yeah, so, so the first one there, Pamela, that I'll go with is to do with stocking rate. Um, if you're currently locked up with TB, are you able to increase your stocking rate and use more fertilizer? So this person's in derogation. So they're saying if you got locked up with TB, can you increase your stocking rate or will you be able to? And what are the implications about your chemical fertilizer allowances? So if you're locked up with TB, the department use, um, there's a calculator for it and they allow you it's an it, they will give you an allowance that you're you won't face penalties necessarily depending on how long you've been locked up for. This also means that um it's calculated on a day by day basis, which means um it depends each farm individually of what your current stocking rate is at. So say you were going to end at two seventy instead of two fifty, um that's taken into account and the area you're farming. So there is an allowance for your stocking rate. But in terms of your NMP, your allowances will be given to you at the start of the year. That's based on your fertilizer. Um, that's based on your soil sample requirements. So if your soil is all at index two or index three, that you'll be get allocated that early in the year anyway. Yeah, and if anything, if you're in the higher your stocking rate, the lower your chemical allowance. So even if you, as you said, in your example, where somebody went over 250, there isn't an extra fertilizer allowance because there's more organic fertilizer going on your farm for that extra stock. Yeah. Um, okay, thanks, Pamela. Another one there, there's someone soil water. So um, somebody's wondering if they're only milking for 15 days in December, do they need capacity for soil water for just 15 days? No, so the rule states the maximum number of cows in your herd for 31 days storage. So um, say you're milking 100 cows, it's still 31 days at 30 litres per cow of soil water, even if you're only milking for 15, and it could be the number of cows in April, but the rule states the maximum number of cows for 31 days. So even like that person, they were only milking for 15. If you didn't milk at all during the month of December, you still are required to have. Yeah, it's still a legal requirement in the transaction plan that you have to have 31 days storage. It's not linked to the winter period. It's linked to 31 days, regardless of the day, the year that you're talking about. Okay. Um, and there's a similar type question, but... So what this person is wondering, if they have only got soil water for 21 days, can the other 10 days be stored with slurry or is it all or nothing? Unfortunately, um, it's all or nothing. So if you are, if you have a tank there and it's say it, it can hold 21 days worth of storage um, and the other 10 days you want to move some of it for the 10 days and fill up the soil water tank again, Unfortunately, this is now classified as slurry and everything on your farm will then be classified as slurry, which means you're now storing it for 16 weeks. Perfect. OK, um, one last one there, Pamela, just on the low emissions on the slurry spreading, you said that um, there's a category of farmers now that have to use low emissions for 2023 that weren't before. Is there TAMS grant still available for people to buy low emission slurry or who does it apply to? Yeah, so for this year, if you're stocked at over 130, you'll have to use low emission slurry spreading. However, 
if you're stocked between 130 and 150, they've given you one year's grace on ter in terms of a TAMS grant. So you can still apply for this year, but you can't thereafter. If you're over between 130 and 150. But that also means that the 130 this year for using low emission slurry spreading is going to 100 next year. So I suppose if you're stocked below 130, you're getting away for one more year. But it, if you were considering a TAMS, it'd probably be important to think about that now. Perfect. Thanks very much. I think we'll give you a break from there. Well done. Thanks, Pamela. Thank you. Thanks, Pamela and Kay. Um, again, just uh, when when Pat is getting ready and, and sharing his slides there, um, there's plenty of questions coming in. K keep the questions coming. Uh, there's no stupid questions, so um, keep them coming, and, and we'll answer them after the after the next presentation. Um, if you want to share your slides, so there, Pat. Everything's Kevin. I think that should be up there now. Yeah, it is. Yeah, that's perfect, Pat. Thanks. So good evening, everybody. I'm uh, Patrick Powers, my name, a Chagas advisor uh, that covers tillage down in Johnstown Castle. And today I'm going to cover some of the different rules and regulations that have come in over the last couple of years, basically, mainly last year, but they carry forward into this year and are, I suppose, some of them are things that people may not be aware of. The first one is the crop diversification rule which will be better known mainly as the tree crop rule. It has been here for a number of years now under the old cap, but it's it's here again and the rules are exactly the same. So anyone that's growing more than 10 hectares of tillage crops, they have to have more than one crop. If you grow over 30 hectares, you have to have three crops. So the main crop cannot consist of more than 75% of that area and the main two crops cannot consist of more than 95% of your overall tillage area. So last year there was a derogation on the tree crop rule due to the war in Ukraine, but this year there is no derogation and the tree crop rule stands as it always has before. The new one that's come in this year is the crop rotational rule, which is not to be mixed up with that. And the crop rotational rule states that one year in four every field must have a break crop. Now, the break crop basically is anything that's not wheat or barley. So the cereal that, that can be used as a break crop is oats, but outside of that, then it's any other crop, whether that be peas, beans, oilseed rape, or maybe on a mixed farm that could be maize or beet or any type of forage crop like that as well that's been harvested, that's classed as a tillage crop. And that has to go into the field at least once in the four years. And that, that four years started last year in 2023. So for everyone this year, you're actually in year two of that. So that is one to be aware of. Now, there is an exemption from that for any farmer that's under 50 hectares of arable land and 50% of that arable land is barley. You are exempt from the crop rotational rule. The tree crop rule will still apply, but the crop rotational rule is now gone. If you are, if you fall into that bracket of being under 50 hectares of arable land with over 50% of that being barley, and that will catch a lot of people. So basically, there are exemptions to some of the other measures. So when we look at the, the tree crop rule, then as we call it, a crop diversification rule, if you plant 50% of your land in cover crops each year, then you're exempt from the tree crop rule. So if you want to use all barley, then basically if after the harvest, 50% of your arable area is planted every year in catch crops before the 15th of September, then you do not have to comply with the tree crop rule. And that may be one that people are not all that aware of. And that, if you are doing that, that will also make you exempt from the crop diversification rule as well. So it will, or the crop rotation rule, I should say. And acres cover crops do not qualify for this. The other exemption that may be applicable to people here tonight is irregardless of the size of your farm. On a farm where over 75% of the land is permanent pasture, then you're exempt from both 
the crop diversification and the crop rotation measures. So that's very important that to know that if over 75% of your land is grass, it's permanent pasture, then you no longer have to worry about either of the measures we spoke about above. And it's important to know what crops are on your farm. And what I mean by that is know what's classed as a tillage crop. We're not just talking about cereals. It could be maize, it could be beet, it could be anything like that. And there will be they will be factored into the tillage area on your farm. So that's something that you have to be aware of when you're making that calculation if you're depending on the 75% rule to make you exempt from some of these measures. So when we move on from that, we have to look at what most farmers do post-harvest for 2024. And it's very similar to last year, but last year these rules changed as we went through the harvest. And because of the inclement weather at harvesting time, it meant that they changed again as time went on and some of the deadlines changed as well. So for this year, as it would stand now, we are back to the normal standard rules that would apply. So that's shallow cultivating your stubbles within 10 days of baling or 10 days of chopping the straw, but within all cases, within 14 days of harvest. And shallow cultivation is something like the picture we see here, where you're coming along with the likes of a disc or a very shallow tine grubber in order to just create a bit of clay to germinate anything that's in the stubble at that time. In some instances, after oilseed rape or where certain grass weed infestations may occur on your farm, and that's mainly in the form of brome, then rolling is permitted rather than shallow cultivation. That's done on a very individual basis, and the farmer would have to know and talk to their advisor about that if, if they were going to use rolling rather than stubble cultivation. It does not apply to late harvested crops or root crops. So potatoes, beet or maize, which will be late harvested crops after the 15th of September. And in odd cases, crops like beans may fall into this category as well. Once you go past the 15th of September, you don't want shallow cultivate as it, it seems to do more harm than good at that point. It is not required for lands destined for winter cereals. So anyone that's moving from a crop into winter wheat, barley or oats, then that does not have to be cultivated in between. So if you cut winter barley or winter wheat in the end of July or the start of August, and your plan is to go back and sow that in the month of October mainly, then it does not have to be cultivated in between. And due to the nitrates directive, any land that is not due for winter cereals or due for a catch crop, 20 to 25% of that must be left intact until the 1st of February, which it doesn't get cultivated, it doesn't get sprayed off, or nothing is done with it until the 1st of February. And that's part of part of Nitrates Action Plan, and it comes under the Protection of Birds Act. So lands ploughed between the 1st of December and the 15th of January. That can be done with any land that's not in a cover crop or that's just after being tilled, basically, as part of the Nitrates Directive where it's been cultivated after harvest. We move on from that then on to buffer zones and buffer zones have become more important and much more relevant. And there's basically a huge amount of information to be known on buffer zones because depending on the crop and depending on what you're applying, the buffer zones change. So the first one for everyone here, if you have a water course on your farm, the uncultivated, unsprayed and unfertilized buffer zone is three meters from that water course. Where you're sowing a catch crop, it's three metres from every boundary in the field, irregardless of a water course or not. So where you have a hedgerow or a water course or a dry drain or anything, it's three metres from that for catch crops. It's a four metre boundary from any water course where you're grazing catch crops in situ or grazing any forage crops. As you move on, then the buffer zones get larger. So... For anyone spreading organic manures of any kind, whether that's slurry, whether it's farmyard manure, pig slurry, poultry manure, it doesn't matter. 
any organic manure that's been applied, there's a five meter buffer zone from any water course. And if you're applying that organic manure within two weeks of the closed season, there is a 10 meter buffer zone. So the buffer zone gets doubled for two weeks either side of the closed period. That's two weeks in September or two weeks in January. The, that buffer zone, that five meter buffer zone for organic manures is doubled. And for anyone sowing late harvested crops, which we would have mentioned them before as mainly any vegetable crop or beet and maize will be the main late harvested crops. There is a six meter buffer zone from any intersecting water course. So if you have a water course on your land that intersects the slope, basically, if it's at the bottom of the field and the field slopes towards it, even if it's only a very gentle slope, there has to be a six meter buffer zone left completely untouched, uncultivated, so that there's grass growing as a buffer strip in that six meters. And that's quite a large buffer strip. And it's something that people may not be aware of. So it is one for anyone growing beet or maize, especially to have a six meter uncultivated zone between the water course and the crop. And from a green cover point of view then, so where we have our green cover that we would have put in, like what we spoke about earlier, you come in after harvest and you grow it or potentially sow cover crops, there's different retention periods for these crops. So just normal green cover under conditionality, like we spoke about, you've come in, you've either sown a catch crop in the field or you've just grubbed it basically in order for regeneration to occur in the stubble, that has to be left intact until the 1st of December each year. And after that, it can be sprayed off or ploughed or tilled whatever way you're going to establish your following crop. If it's an acres cover crop, it must be retained in place until the 1st of January before that's destroyed or ploughed back in. On the areas, the 20 to 25% that hasn't been touched, that must remain in place until the 1st of February. And anyone with overwinter stubble in acres, that must retain in place until the 1st of February as well. And anyone grazing catch crops, it must be remembered that there is a lieback has to be in place. Now that lieback does not have to be a grass lieback as was seen before. It can be grass, but that lieback can be just stubble that's unsown. So if you're wanting to graze your catch crops, a lieback area there of 43% of the catch crop area must be in place. So we see the example on the screen. If you have 12 acres of rape that you're looking to graze, then you need 5.2 acres of lieback, which hasn't been sown. As a minimum, it can be a stubble, or if not a grass field adjacent to it that the animals can go back into, must be available. So that's another one that only came in last year and people may not be fully aware of it. So when we talk about spraying and ploughing, then there's just a couple of dates that must be adhered to as well. So when we look at our basically spraying herbicides between July and November on any given year, you must have a green cover in place within six weeks. So it can't be just left idle if you spray off any area, whether that's grass or arable, in that point, you have to establish a green cover. There is a rule in place that has been there for a number of years where you're growing seed or malting crops that in order to control certain weeds, 25% of your land can be sprayed off in the autumn before the 1st of December. And that is true, but it still cannot be done before the 15th of October. So where some people may have sprayed off in September after the corn is cut, that cannot be done now. It has to be waited until after the 15th of October in order to do that spraying to control scotch, which will be the main one in that situation. So when you're plowing basically grassland, the only thing that can't be done is it can't be plowed between the 16th of October and the 13th of November. It has to stay intact with, the, with that in that point. But any time before that, a green cover must be established and any time after the 30th of November, then you're just looking at plowing it to establish a crop for the following year. So basically what people need to know from this is that 
know what cropping rotation and basically what crop diversification is required on your farm, whether you need to comply with the tree crop rule, whether you need to comply with the crop rotation rule. You need to work out those figures, work out what percentages of tillage ground you have compared to grass and know if you need to comply with these. Know what buffer zones are required for your crops. If that's a cereal crop where you need a three meter buffer zone or whether it might be a late harvest crop like beet or maize and you need to have a six meter buffer zone. That needs to be known before you go out cultivating, before you plow or before you spray off. Post harvest, know how much your farm needs to be shallow cultivated. If you have 20 to 25% that needs to be left, know what that is because it's not 20 to 25% of what's left after you sow your catch crops or after you sow a certain percentage of winter corn, it's 20 to 25% of your total tillage area. And where you have green cover on your farm, whether that's just natural regeneration after grubbing or, or whether that's catch crops you've planted as part of the acre scheme or just to, to benefit your soil on your own farm, you need to know the dates, as we discussed before, of when they can be destroyed with glyphosate or when you can plow them. Thank you. Thanks for that, Pat. It was uh, very interesting. Um, just, Kay, um, there's a good few questions coming in there. Um, just as you're asking the questions, I'm just going to put up on the, uh, sh share the screen. And, and if you can all get out your phones and just um, scan the QR code, um, uh, and, and and just fill out the feedback survey. So work away, it's okay. Okay. Um. Thanks, Pat. Well done. Just a question there. Um. On the crop diversification, or the two and three crop rule. Do the acres crops, for example, in this case, it was wild bird cover. Does that count as a second or a third crop? It can, but the problem is, you suffer quite a substantial reduction in payment for that acres crop if you use it as part of the crop diversification rule okay. so it, it can be used if you're if you're stuck but it 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 does come as uh quite a penalty for in the acres payment it can it can only okay. either work for either conditionality or for acres it can't do both you're not able to use it to get payments twice yeah okay um Pat, you mentioned about the buffers, um, and I'm sure that it's news to some people on the 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 different the likes of the six meter uncultivated buffer for the the late sown crops. Is there much of a penalty, or would you know off the top of your head what the penalties would be? Because I'd imagine there is farmers in that scenario that haven't adhered to date to these rules. It, there is a penalty. Um, generally, they start off from three percent, but depending on how large the area is, they can increase. And that's on your base, or is it on all the payments? It's on everything. Okay. It's a nitrates. It's a nitrates penalty, so it covers all your payments. And how is it picked up? Uh, generally on inspection. Okay. It doesn't appear to be picked up from satellite imagery. It's generally on on farm if you get a cross compliance inspection but a lot of the inspections now cross report so whether you got a cross compliance in acres a county council inspection if any of them pick it up they generally tend to cross report them and you will be looking at like i say depending on the size of the area the size of the water course and possibly the level of pollution that may have occurred if there was runoff into the drain coming from the field or a lot of clay or sediment going in then it could be seen as being done on purpose and that's, that can increase the penalty, but they generally tend to start at 3%. Okay. And there's another follow-on to that one there that somebody wants to know, do they leave a buffer zone around a pond? Or like what's the definition of a wild wild or sort of post? Technically, no. If the pond is marked on a 1 is to 5,000 map, they'll need a buffer zone around it. Okay. If it's a small agricultural pond and there's no designated stream coming in and out of it, then the answer will be no. But if there is, then yes, you would. It would have to be treated as the same as the water course that both feeds and, and exits the pond. So people in derogation or over 170 would be familiar with the one that's 5,000 garden survey maps that they're supposed to have. If it was a very small, rent. very yeah. small pond, like a marrow hole in the middle of a field fed by a spring that doesn't have a, a drain or a stream going in or out of it, then no, it doesn't come under any legislation. 
it probably might be a bad idea to have a buffer around it, but no, it's technically not not part of the rules. Okay. Um and look, if you can't find out, talk to your advisor, we'll be able to look it up for you. Exactly. If there, if anyone has any issues, if they're wondering whether or not the rules apply to them, contact your advisor and ask them and they'll be able to very clearly indicate what you what you need to do. Okay. And one last one there for you. Um is the schemes like the tillage incentive scheme and the strong cooperation schemes that were there in the last two years? Have you any updates on them for 2024? The tillage incentive scheme is only there for people who applied last year. So the tillage incentive scheme was a two year scheme, even when they came in. It paid at a rate of 400 euros per hectare for the first year and 200 euros per hectare for the following year if you continued to till that ground. So last year, anyone who availed of the tillage incentive for the first time and got the 400 euro, they will still get the 200 euro this year as a secondary payment, but it is not open for new people to apply. Okay, so it's only if the, I got 400 The last straw year. incorporation scheme is a yearly scheme, but it does appear that that is going to be there this year again. Okay, so there's a lot to consider, I suppose, for, for farmers, if you have tillage on your farm, depending on what schemes you're in, how to sit down and I suppose plan it out with your advisor or to exactly what cropping and what requirements you need and all those routes. Thanks, Pat. Um, okay. Back over to you there, Kevin. Um, yeah. yeah, and the display settings, you can just swap, but it, I think everybody should be able to see that anyway. Okay. Um display settings yeah look um just just to, thanks very much for that Kay. just just to summarize um and look um if you all can use that that feedback server there um um or you can open it with your camera um and and just complete the, the simple questions uh it, it would be brilliant uh for ourselves just to get a bit of feedback uh on the presentations tonight and, and on the webinar i suppose just to, to summarize look we're after throwing a lot of information uh at you there over the last hour um but just a few simple messages which i took from the presentation was um if we if we start off you know make sure to take your soil samples this year um you know without soil samples and and you're stocked over 130 kilos you have no pea allowance and on top of that make sure you get a nutrient nutrient management plan done for your farm Moving on uh, from that, uh, we went on to Pamela's presentation. You need to know what stocking rate you're at. So how is the 250 back to 220 going to affect your farm? And know your band. So are you in band one, are you in band two, or are you in band three? And make, make decisions based on that. You also need to calculate your soil water for your farm and, and how that's going to affect your farm for 2024. Moving on from that, we went on to Pat's uh, presentation and I suppose more for, the, for, more for the tillage side of the house. And a few things I took from that, Pat, was that, look, if you have over great, greater than 75% permanent pasture or grass, uh, you don't need to worry about your crop di diversification or your crop rotational measures. You need to know your buffer zones uh, for your farm and you need to know uh, your green cover requirements and how they're going to affect your farm. Uh, finally, just to conclude, I just want to thank our speakers. I want to just thank uh, Pamela, um, uh, Kay, um, um, uh, Pat, um, and, and Katie. Uh, they, they were all uh, very informative tonight, uh, and, and you all got a great deal from it. And finally, I just want to thank yourselves um, for, for coming on the call. I hope you got uh, a bit from... Uh, the webinar tonight and uh, hopefully uh, 2024 uh, goes well for y'all so yeah just thanks very much to everyone uh, thanks to our speakers thanks Kay for, 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 for the questions and I think we'll, we'll finish up with that so thank you